UFC 296 just wrapped up and the prelims and early prelims definitely delivered. We can't say the same thing about the main card as it had a lot more lackluster fights than we expected it to have, especially the main event. We expected Colby Covington to be a lot more aggressive than he was. We expected Leon to counter more than he actually did because Colby gave him a lot of openings to counter and the incentive is on Colby to make something happen as Leon is just kicking him from distance. It reminds me of Israel Adesanya. When Israel's beating these guys by leg kicking and jabbing them from distance, it's up to the guys to get in on him and win the fight. Same thing here with Leon. Colby has to fight his usual style, be aggressive, pressure, wrestle, just get in Leon's face, but he ultimately didn't do that. And the reason why he may have lost a bit of his focus was maybe because he didn't eat Factor today. The best online food delivery service ready to give you fresh new meals put together by Factor's gourmet chefs with incredible nutritional value. I personally love it after the gym. They got all different kind of meals for you. This time I do got the chickpea masala, but the peanut Buddha bowl is just the best. This is like top tier stuff. And I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't have to go anywhere. They deliver it to me. I just got to warm it up. And yes, I will always microwave my food. And with the amazing food also comes some pretty good shakes. I got a protein shake here. Chocolate banana flavor. As you can see here, 18 grams of protein. And it tastes amazing, man. Whatever you prefer on the menu, it's going to taste so good. And it's all very easy. Who wants to go out during the winter season when you have Factor delivering it to you? And they got a deal for you as well. By clicking the link in the description below or by heading to factor75.com and use the code THEWEASEL50, you can get 50% off your first Factor order. That's an incredible deal, man. For anybody that has not tried Factor, I'm telling you, man, it's such a big diet changer that you don't want to go back to anything else. So I would give it like a 5 or 6 out of 10. The reason why I would bump it up a point or two is because Drickus and Sean Strickland apparently brawled it out in the audience, which was the most action that happened after the Josh Emmett fight. It had a lot of names, it had a lot of interesting matchups on paper. The prelims and early prelims definitely pick it up, but everything else... From the main event, co-main event, Shafgat's performance before the finish, even Tony Ferguson versus Patty Pimblett, all four of these fights on the main card did not deliver as we expected them to. The only one that did was Josh Emmett, right? Josh Emmett had a knockout of the year contender that started the main card, but it's kind of a shame that the rest of the fights didn't live up to what Josh Emmett did. So let's start with the real main event. Sean Strickland just put the hands and elbows on Drickus Duplessis in the audience. And he was nice enough to ask Gilbert Burns and his family to move over before he does it. He literally did that. He goes, can you guys move over? And he looked pretty gentle about it. And then just blitzed Drickus. Fighters should not be doing this, man. Because he was throwing elbows at Drickus. If he cut Drickus up, he could have put Drickus out of the fight. And why were they positioned right behind each other? Why was Drickus even two rolls behind him? He should be on the other side of the arena from Sean Strickland. No idea why they were sitting that close to each other, where everybody knew very well that Sean Strickland would do something like that. Crazy, man. So let's talk about that main event. Leon Edwards defeats Colby Covington by a very comfortable decision. 49-46 on all scorecards. And he just did what he had to do. Stay from distance, kick the legs, counter here and there. And he could have just done that the whole fight. He didn't have to wrestle like he did. He didn't have to grapple with Colby. That was kind of just chasing a moral victory and it ultimately costed him the fifth round. Leon would have literally have won this fight if he just kept throwing leg kicks. And Colby, he was trying to play the character at the end to win some fans over that performance. For some reason, he was talking about Trump and stuff. And even Trump looked like he was disappointed. Like, look at Trump's face. He was like, don't talk about me after you just fought like that. Don't try to represent me after that kind of performance. I'm trying to win the election here. But yeah, not too much to say about the fight. There wasn't a lot of technique shown or anything like that. Just a lot of good feints from Leon. Leon versus Bilal Muhammad is next fight. And I would like to see Colby Covington fight Shafkat Rachmanov. Alexandra Pantoja defeated Brennan Roy Val again. This guy's like becoming the king of rematches, but this one was way more difficult than the first time they fought each other. Royval definitely upped his grappling defense overall. He did enough defensively to either lock himself down with Pentosia to not get his back taken for most of the fight. It was very questionable how he threw himself into the crucifix at one point. It looked like he tried to flip over Pentosia by reaching under his legs, but then he got pinned down from that. That was very strange to see from Royval, but he's a 50-50 fighter for a reason. He will throw himself into danger to win each battle. Pantoja had great body work, landing really good body kicks throughout the fight, but he definitely slowed down like from the third round and on. His cardio looked less in this one than it did against Brandon Moreno, even though the Brandon Moreno fight was way faster of a pace. So that was kind of interesting. I think just a heavy grappling game in this one against a bigger opponent 
that has to play a factor, probably zapped a bit of the cardio every time they exchanged. And Royval got rocked as he does in most of his fights. Pantoja landed some good right overhands. Brandon Royval in the fifth round specifically was throwing a lot of jabs, some good crosses. A lot of them though were getting partially blocked, not landing too clean, but he was firing so much. Plenty of them did get through. He fought in the fifth round like you're supposed to, but as soon as Pantoja took him down again, he was able to keep it down there up until the end of the fight. There was another point, I believe it was at the end of the third round or fourth round, where Pantoja had Royval's back for such a long time, he got into a painful looking neck crank. That must have hurt. And then eventually tried to get on top of him. He tried to rotate on top while he had the figure four, and Royval was leaning on the lock of the figure four. All Pantoja really needs to do is bring his right leg out from under Royval as his left foot is planted on the mat and to get a grip to pull himself all the way on top of Royvel with his left hand Pantoja try to grab around Royvel's neck and pull himself on top bringing out that right foot from under but Royvel was onto it and leaned forward away from Pantoja's body which is going to cause his arm to extend making the grip a lot weaker and while doing that Royvel is also leaning toward Pantoja's left leg that's around the top. So what he does there is he pushes the knee outward with his right hand and frames off Pantoja with his left forearm. This is throwing Pantoja off balance toward the opposite direction and it gives Royvel a lot of space under where he turns himself around clockwise holding tight Pantoja's left leg and uses that and uses that to roll around but then he used that single leg to get on top of Pantoja. Just beautiful work. This is actually some of the best work from Royvel in the entire fight. The end of that fourth round and that's where he's landing a bunch of the elbows but he did get reckless you know 50 50 style just go crazy and Pantoja was able to attack the leg not necessarily to get a submission but to create enough separation between them two so Royvel cannot continue this attack so he was using it as a defensive technique to keep Royvel away from him and you can also see not only with one leg but with both legs he puts it around and on top of Royvel's calf some really good work from Pantoja and Royvel man and man does Pantoja have an iron chin. He ate a head kick at one point, which he took Royvel down for. He ate a knee to the face at one point. There is no knocking this guy out. It's just impossible. Davidson Figueroa came the closest, and he couldn't even do it. Not even Davidson could have do it. And that guy's a 135er now, with the most outrageous power ever in the 125-pound division. Not the most entertaining fight, as, you know, most of the fights on the main card. There are quite lackluster grappling fests, but as a fan of grappling technique, this and Shafka vs. Wonderboy are definitely fights where Worth studying. Shavka Rachmanov beats Wonderboy. I would say an easy win, but Wonderboy defended a lot of takedowns, way more than we expected. But the thing is, Shavka doesn't really shoot too much. He shot that one time in the second round. Most of his takedowns generally come from the clinch. He tries to trip you out, tries to pick you up off the high crotch. And that sort of style, I think, is a lot tougher to take down someone like Wonderboy, who's able to shift his body position and hips so quickly. But eventually, Shavka did eat a counter left, I believe, as Wonderboy was moving back toward the fence. Took the shot very well, got into the clinch after that, but eventually was able to pick up Wonderboy, kind of knee tap him to the ground, threw the handcuff in there, got the rear naked choke without the body position, it looked like it was going to be a finish from there. But then you also saw Shafkat throw in the left arm through the overhook and keep it straight under Wonderboy's neck to keep a constant threat for the Bravo choke, but eventually was able to get to his back, choke him out, didn't even need the hooks in, way too tight of a squeeze, and Wonderboy eventually finished the first fighter to ever submit Wonderboy. And we do have to also remember that Wonderboy fought Gilbert Burns, who took him to the ground many times throughout those three rounds and wasn't able to get a submission. Shafkat submitted Wonderboy where Gilbert Burns and Blow Muhammad couldn't. That in itself is a bit of a statement, although the fight wasn't too exciting, it wasn't the most entertaining thing, but there was definitely great grappling technique to study off of Shafkat in that fight once they hit the ground. After that performance, I think you do Shavka versus the loser of Leon and Colby. And if he wins that, he gets a title shot. As we know that Bilal is most likely getting the next title shot. I would like to see Shavka fight Bilal. That's what I would like to see. But Dana said that Bilal gets the next shot. He was the backup fighter for the title fight. And as for Wonderboy, I would have him fight Sean Brady or Jack Della Maddalena. I personally like the Jack Della fight stylistically, but Sean Brady makes more sense in the rankings though. Patty Pimblett beats Tony Ferguson by decision, 30-27 all scorecards. Tony looked even slower than before, man. He looked way more unathletic, and the belief of his comeback performance just isn't there anymore. There's no reason to even believe it at this point. Patty was the opponent to look good against, because if we're going to be honest, Patty didn't even look necessarily too great either. 
especially in a stand-up. Grappling-wise, of course, Petty's great on the ground, and he showed it a bit. He did gas out in the third, trying to finish Tony Ferguson early. Tony did let some body punches and stuff, but he didn't react to the punches coming his way at all. He got dropped in the first, and that was the part that really worried me the most about this fight, was when Petty was going to rush him down. And it showed, Tony didn't have anything for Patty when he got ran down. And it was so, this may be a little bit of like bias as a Tony fan, but it was really agitating to watch in that third round. The fight stayed down there while Patty was on top and it did not get stood up. Maybe it didn't make sense and maybe we just all wanted Tony to have a chance at the end of that fight because it looked like he could have done something to Patty for the second half of that third round, but only if the fight got stood up. I have to go back and watch just to see if it actually made sense. But that's it for Tony Ferguson, seven losses in a row. From longest win streak in history to longest losing streak in lightweight history. So for Tony Ferguson, he's got to retire. I don't imagine they give him any more opponents. And as for Patty Pimblett, he should fight Bobby Green. I think that's the next fight for Patty. He's on a quite a big win streak right now. And Bobby Green's coming off a loss. He's toward the tail end of the top 15. That fight, I think, makes the most sense at this point. Josh Emmett puts out Bryce Mitchell with one punch, and he was shaking. You know, seizing convulsions. It was a very, very scary sight from Bryce Mitchell, man. I hope the guy's okay. That may have been a first in the UFC, a fighter shaking like that after getting KO'd unconscious. Josh Emmett, I believe, is the most powerful featherweight of all time. Punch for punch, nobody hits like this guy. And at 38 years old, it's insane. The amount of speed he's able to even hold up at his older age for a lighter fighter too. And it was pretty simple of how he lined that up. He was just moving off to the left, but didn't step into Mitchell until he saw Mitchell plant for his own right hand. And that is the worst thing to do because when a fighter is moving their head off the center line and you're planting while keeping yours on the center line, that fighter is going to get hit. So Josh Emmett steps into and far out the left side to line up his right hand with all the momentum and leverage possible. Everything he's got into the punch. And Mitchell planted, shot the straight, missed as Emmett dipped on the outside. And that was all she wrote. Right hand to the face put Bryce Mitchell out and Bryce took this up on short notice man it goes to tell you you have to calculate the risks taking fights on short notice like this I believe after a performance like that what do you do with Josh Emma at this point he fought Kelvin Cater he fought Yair Rodriguez he fought Tapuria I think it's only gonna matter who wins and loses their next fight so if Volkanovski loses he's gonna get an immediate rematch against Tapuria so that can't happen now if Max fights Aljamain Sterling I think the loser of that fight could go up against Emmett or Brian Ortega, whether he wins or loses, that's a good one as well. There is also Arnold Allen. I guess that one makes the most sense. And as for Bryce Mitchell, take a long time off after that. Dustin Jacoby and Alonzo Menafield threw down, man. This is a pretty good fight. Action-packed. Dustin Jacoby getting rocked a few times, which ultimately caused Menafield to win. He did have good pressure from the outside. He was putting together some good elbows, holding Alonzo up against the fence at points. And showed good heart. It looked like multiple times Dustin Jacoby was going to get finished. And he just keeps his hands way too low. He looks technically superior in most areas of striking. But the simple fact that he always drops his hands could even allow someone like Menafield, who should not be on his skill level when it comes to striking, land some devastating blows. That left hook as Dustin was moving back was crazy. And I can only imagine Dustin's kicking himself for allowing something like that to happen. You could do a lot with these two. You could put Alonzo Menafield up against Ryan Spann. You could do Dustin Jacoby versus Dominic Reyes. Those are two interesting fights. Arena Aldana versus Carol Rosa was a very action-packed fight. Both fighters throwing back and forth. Aldana had a very threatening jab. Loved the way she throws the right straight, but she did get kicked a lot to the legs, man. The only thing I didn't like what Rosa was doing was a lot of these slapping hooks. Even though everybody knows that Renal Donna keeps her hands up all the time. Some were getting through here and there, but then plenty of them were getting blocked. The jab is much more effective, but the low kicks overall were the major thing from Carol Rosa. Going inside, outside with those, just way too many leg kicks taken from Irina Aldana, man. But she was able to win the fight ultimately through her boxing. That right straight, especially in the beginning of the third round, was very powerful. Rocked Rosa. It's good to see her being a lot more active for this fight than she was against Amanda Nunes because she looked very gun-shy against Nunes. Here, not at all, man. But then again, Rosa is not Amanda Nunes. It'd be cool to see Aldana fight maybe Juliana Pena since Pennington is fighting Silva for the belt. Aldana's fought like most of the fighters here, man. She already fought Holly Holm. She fought Pennington in a very close one several years ago. She just beat Carl Rosa. I think um, Pena is the next opponent for her. And as for Carl Rosa, I guess Misha Tate. Cody Garbrandt getting to his knockout ways again. 
put down Brian Kelleher, did not need ground and pound shots, Kelleher fell flat to his face, and it looked like he did it kind of on purpose to protect himself, knowing that he was done. And it's great to see Cody extend his winning streak here. He looked pretty decent against Trevin Jones, and here, he looked powerful and fast. I'm not gonna say, if we're gonna be completely honest, I'm not gonna say he looked amazing technically because he was doing a lot of the same stuff that got him caught before in fact when you look at the first exchange where cody rocked kelleher he did almost the exact same thing when he fought tj the second time remember when him and tj were trading right hands but tj was getting off the center line and cody's head was right there to be hit the same thing happened here it's working for him this time because he is going up against lesser competition similar kind of competition when he was rising up before he fought for the title. His blitzing and tunnel vision was working back then, but as soon as he goes up against the better guys again, it's still not going to work against them. Like, can you imagine if he fought Pietro Jan? That would've been the worst opponent for him tonight, because Pietro Jan does an amazing job of covering up on your hooks, catching them, and then firing his counter hook. Cody would've been knocked out by Pietro Jan if they fought tonight, and many other opponents as well. But thankfully, that was not TJ in there, that was not Pietro Jan who would catch and counter him. That's the worst opponent to do that to. Thankfully, he didn't fight Davis and Figueredo, who's the guy he called out. These guys would have knocked Cody out in that exchange because he threw his right hook naked and he has such a big speed advantage as well as Keller doesn't move much. He's not an elusive fighter whatsoever. He doesn't have any kind of real footwork to him. So he was just there to be hit. And Cody has enough power where you do not want to take his shots, no matter how old he gets in the fight game. And that pretty much started the beginning of the end where then he just barraged him in the clinch and went all Cody Garbrandt war mode, and Kelleher could not take that kind of punishment. That right hand inside of the, the last exchange where he put Kelleher down, it was actually pretty impressive how a punch like that finished off the fight, because that punch right there didn't look too powerful. But again, it's not the punches that get winded up the most or swung back the hardest that delivers that kind of power. He hit the button precisely and put Kelleher down. So he looked fast, he looked powerful, I like some of the switch ups of following into the clinch after he throws his own punches to not trade with Kelleher before he rocks him. So you'll see sometimes Cody would blitz in and then clinch up immediately afterwards and not give Kelleher that opening after not connecting clean with his own punches. So that was a better understanding of how to escape danger in the pocket where he's been hurt there plenty of times in his career. But he went away from that back to his old ways when he knew he had Kelleher hurt. He's got to watch out for that too man because if he goes and rocks another opponent and let's say they got the ability to throw punches back he could get put out actually something similar happened with Pedro Munoz so great to see that Cody is winning and he called out Davis and Figueroa which I don't think is a great call out because number one it's way too dangerous of an opponent for him in my opinion and number two Cody's not even ranked and Davidson's like number eight and he's only looking up as the former champ of the flyweight division there'd be no sense for him to look down in the rankings I like Davidson versus Pietrian and I would say Cody versus Chris Gutierrez is the next fight to make Ariana Lipsky submits Casey O'Neill in the second round we were all wrong about Casey O'Neill have we overrated her a bit or just underestimated Ariana Lipsky well at the end of the day the hotter girl won so and she let her power known in the beginning of that first round whenever Casey O'Neill would step in to establish something Lipsky would just barrage her with punches overwhelming her with her power even from the first single leg Lipsky was firing those knees trying to frame off create some separation we saw a hip toss from Lipsky man she's getting so much better as a grappler in this sport because she came into it mainly just striking and her grappling was always looked at as her biggest weakness but now two submission wins in the UFC pulling off very good reversals against Casey O'Neill a lot of people believed if she got the fight to the ground she would have a major advantage but still showing her dangerous striking in the beginning of that second round where she stepped off square to the left to line up the right hook as Casey O'Neill followed into that direction causing a good interception with the right even though the defenselessness of Lipsky in that moment could be worrisome against other opponents her power was enough for her to be confident in those exchanges from the first round to allow herself to beat out O'Neill in the second round like that and just tossed her over reversing Casey O'Neill when O'Neill went for the single leg takedown big ground upon shots led to the rear naked choke threat and then eventually turned that into an arm bar didn't look like it was all the way in there until you saw the extension on the arm Lipsky's body position compared to O'Neal's could make you think that the angle was off, but when you see the arm, it didn't even matter at that point. Amazing performance from Ariana Lipsky, man. Probably the best of her career. Beat Casey O'Neal in every aspect of MMA in that fight. Tagir, 
dominating Cody Durden. We got to talk about the grab. We got to talk about all the cheating though, man. Fence grabs. What is up with the referees and allowing fighters to grab the fence like that? Completely insane. Now, does that mean that Tagir is a bad fighter? No. I mean, he's a great dominant wrestler, dominant performance. T Cody Durden tried to engage behind his jab, but he committed a bit too much with his feet and ran himself right into Tagir. And very interesting about Tagir Ulampakov, he actually did a very similar thing to what Ariana Lipsky did, stepping off to his left to get squared, lining up the right hand. His is a little bit more exaggerated to the point where it kind of looked like he shifted into the opposite stance, and he did have a much better lean than Lipsky did. Lipsky was kind of straight up the whole time, but this was early in the first round. There wasn't really a power dynamic established like there was between Lipsky and O'Neal, so Tagir's dip caused Durden to lose track of his target, and the punches you don't see hurt the most. If he loses track of his opponent, he's not going to see the punch coming either. And that guillotine he pulled was so fast, but Durden did not allow Tagir to get body control, and wound it up reversed and wound it up on top, fighting and controlling the biceps, but Tagir had a very strong right overhook, while also having good left wrist control, taking over the positions with his butterfly hook. He had a nasty trip while his back was close to the fence, got his back, figure four, went for the choke, looked like he was about to get it, second round was chaos, Durden going forward, just needs to bring his hands up and really be respectful of Tagir's punching ability, because Tagir was sitting behind the jab quite a bit, and he was leaning away from Durden's aggression. And what was up with him grabbing onto the fence with his toes, you see that? He has Durden's back, which is a very dominant position, he's a great grappler, but why is he grabbing onto the fence like that, and the ref isn't even taking the position away? He's literally holding himself on top of Durden by gripping the fence with his toes. And because of that, Durden can't shake him off, Durden can't really move much. I can imagine how heavy Tagir felt on top of him like that. And there was even a point, it was like 2 minutes or 20 seconds of that second round, he was gripping onto the fence right in front of the ref, and the ref did nothing about it. He did it so many times, and the ref was only giving him warnings. Warnings only mean you got away with it, it's just reassurance. It's actually good for an opponent sometimes to hear a warning because they know, ah, I got away with it, he's not going to do anything about that. And warnings are given so often, more than actual point deductions, more than actual position withdrawals, it's quite insane. Tagir at the end of the day was a better fighter than Durden, but man, what is with the fence grabs and the ref doing nothing about it? After that performance, I think Tagir Ilnambakov should fight Matt Schnell or Alex Perez after his fight. Andre Feely with the first round knockout, he doesn't really get too many of those. Really good power man from him, because we don't see him knock opponents out like that. He was doing his usual funky stuff, switching stances, being quite fluid out there, taking different angles, and off the leg kick, as soon as felt the leg kick, he moved into it, did not respect the power of the leg kick at all. And when you throw a power kick, it takes you a lot longer to get back into your stance, and when you're trying to get back into your stance, you're also not able to move anywhere. So Feely, Walked into it, stepping to the left, creating momentum for his right hand, decks Almeida to the chin and puts him away. Gaziev TKO's Boudet against the fence. These guys look like they would be brothers, like Gaziev is Boudet's like long lost Russian brother. Gaziev seemed to be a lot more powerful. He did not respect the power of Boudet. He was intercepting with the jab, whereas Boudet was moving around a lot. Not too much technique between the two guys. And Gaziev was just walking him down the whole time, trying to land some good knees. Boudet thought he had something going when he clinched up with Gaziev. But the guy's from Dagestan, so you know that's not going to work. And Gaziev has so much confidence in his own power. He was literally firing off naked right straights with his left hand down. It did not care at all if Boudet was going to counter him. And soon enough, it looked like Boudet just did not want to be part of this fight anymore. His eye got damaged badly. He shot that last resort double leg that got completely stuffed. Looked like Boudet ran into a wall. And the fight eventually was over. Great performance by Gaziev, man. 